Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron, and I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Lynn Barr, otherwise known as the Cat Doc. Lynn is a feline-only veterinarian and CEO of Desi and Rue, just for cats. Her life has been devoted to helping cats and the people who love them, and she's grateful for the opportunity to do so. It was her first cat, Rudolph, who guided her into veterinary medicine, and her current cats, Desi and Rue, who led her to become an entrepreneur making cat toys. She knows how profound animals can affect our lives and celebrate the power of the human-animal bond. Her focus is on finding ways to help strengthen that bond, knowing that it makes this world a better place. Lynn, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much, Stacey. I'm excited to be here. I am very much looking forward to this conversation. I am, I'm just thrilled, thrilled to have you here with us today. And um, I just was wanted to find out, you had your first cat, Rudolph, and find out more about how did you develop such a great passion for cats? Well, actually, it was totally due to Rudolph. <laughs> I um, had been a dog person before he adopted me, and he opened up the world of cats spoke to me in a way that only a cat can. And I changed my entire profession in order to become a veterinarian so that I could work with just cats. So what was so special about Rudolph? His pink little nose. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't resist it. Actually, a stray cat had given birth to a litter of kittens and It happened to be a heat wave in Atlanta. I came home and was listening to the news that said, bring all animals inside. It was really over 100 degrees here. And I brought her and her kittens into the house and uh, changed my life. I, I can't really pinpoint exactly what it was other than some otherworldly ESP, karma, I have no idea, but it it did. It just changed my life. So Rudolph was the reason that you decided to go into veterinary medicine? 100%. I was a legal secretary at the time. Wow, that is fantastic. Talk about pivoting. I don't know if folks are familiar with that term. A woman named Jenny Blake wrote this book about pivoting and and changing your career and direction. And that sounds like an incredible pivot. It was. It it was beyond me. I had no choice in the matter. It was just following my heart and following my soul. I had no idea that I spoke cat, that inside my body, I was a cat. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Rudolph changed my world, as well as my two current cats, Desi and Rue. I had no idea I wanted to become an entrepreneur and make cat toys, but they are my first two indoor-only cats, and they, too, have changed my life. Very interesting. So when you went into veterinary school, did you know you wanted to be a feline-only veterinarian at that point in time? I did. I knew from the start. I think, you know, it was so long ago, it was almost 40 years ago that I made that decision. So the the specifics I don't remember very well, but Rudolph had actually had some medical issues early on and dealing with the veterinarian, I knew that I wanted a place for cats only. Way before there was ever a feline only veterinarian they didn't exist at the time, but I didn't like taking him into somewhere there, there were barking dogs. I really just envisioned an entire practice that was devoted to just cats. That's fantastic. Yeah. When you said 40 years ago, I mean, I, I can't imagine feline only veterinarians back from my childhood. To me, I would say it would be within the last 20 years that that practice has really, you know, become more common but it sounds like you were a real visionary with that concept of feline-only veterinarians. Were there others out there that you knew of at that time, or was it really just you going into veterinary school saying, this is going to be my focus and I'm bound and determined to do it? 
Um, I believe at the time it was just my focus, but so I worked as a legal secretary and went to school at night. It took me actually eight years to get my undergrad and I didn't actually get my degree. I went to veterinary school without actually graduating from undergrad. But once I was in vet school, I did find a handful of veterinarians who did cats only and actually did an internship with a few of them. Oh, that's wonderful. It's great to know. I I think that a feline-only veterinarian is a fantastic trend, not only for folks that own cats, but also for community cats. And I'm wondering, from the perspective of a a feline veterinarian, you know, what are your thoughts with regards to community cats? I agree. Um, Feline veterinarians are a special breed, and they go into it because they love cats. Not every veterinarian wants to work with cats. And being a feline-only veterinarian, our skills are honed in on one species, and we get to know them really well. So I think they're important, and they're important to treating community cats because, you know, as you know, many of the feral cats are difficult to handle. They don't take well to people. And having a person who is specially trained to deal with them is in their best interest. And as you say, creating an environment where a a feral cat, a community cat, any cat can feel more comfortable where you're not surrounded with barking dogs or crazy smells and that kind of thing is really very, very helpful. Um, over the last 40 years, what have been some of your challenges that you've faced? Well, I believe the biggest challenge now is indoor-only cats. Um, 40 years ago, there was no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, veterinarians have done a great job in, in promoting the indoor lifestyle, but I think they've dropped the ball as to what to do now that cats are inside. I think of it as a new breed. I think an indoor-only cat is is certainly very different than cats that go in and out or your community cats. They're living totally different lifestyles. And you mentioned that you have Desi and Rue that are living with you as indoor-only kitties and that they led you in this direction of thinking about cat toys, being a veterinarian to cat toys, taking that path. Can you just tell me a little bit about what your thought process was in in thinking about how cat toys could really improve their lives? Yes. Indoor cats living long lives, 15, 20, 25 years within four walls, is a challenge for them and for owners. They lack a lot of enrichment. There are specific things that I really am concerned about, and that is the fact that many indoor cats don't get direct sunlight, sunshine, fresh air, the ability to eat grass, and they're developing diseases and illnesses that we see are tied to lack of environmental enrichment by being housed solely indoors. And that's a big concern of mine. I have spent so much time in the exam room one-on-one trying to educate and teach owners how to keep their indoor cats happy and healthy. And I wanted a bigger voice. I wanted to reach the public in masses. And so that was how I developed Desi and Rue to not only provide owners with tools to help them, but also the education behind why they need to play, to have enrichment, and to try to see life from a cat's point of view. Can you tell me the toys that you've been involved with developing and creating? Tell me a little bit about a few of them. Well, our first one is claimed to fame is our hide and sneak cat tunnel. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that cats actually need places to hide. They um, prefer tunnels and caves and It's an important aspect that outdoor cats actually get to find places. Most of them are born in caves and in hiding places. And indoor cats really needed kind of a place of their own. I took what they love, the three things they love best, and that it's paper. You know, what Mm -hmm. cat doesn't like a paper bag? (laughs) They love boxes. It's the best way to catch a cat. And the design of a tunnel. And so the hide and sneak is a paper 
cat tunnel that can be put away because toy rotation is really important, mm. not leaving all toys out every day mm. for your cat. And so it folds up very nicely, can be put away, brought back out. And um, cats love it. Interesting. So toy cycling. Yes, toy rotation. In fact, I, you know, I call it toy fatigue. Ah. But having too many toys out, never rotating them. I, when people come in the exam room, one of the first things I say is, you know, do you play with your cat? And everybody says, yes. And I say, how do you play with your cat? And inevitably they say, well, they have a basket of toys. Right. <laughs> and, you know, owners think that going out and buying lots of toys is all that they need to do. But cats really need the owner to play with them, physically play with them. And leaving toys around, having a whole room full of toys gets boring very quickly. So rotating toys, putting them away and bringing one or two out each day, a different one, brings excitement and newness. It's novel. And what are your thoughts uh, with regards to catnip and toys? Um, if a cat reacts to catnip, I love it. Uh, we sell a product called Cloud9, which is silver vine. It's an alternative to catnip. My uh, philosophy is variety is the spice of life. And so the more things that you can introduce your cat to and the more ways that you play with them and giving them lots of variety is what makes them happy. Do you struggle with self-care and taking time for yourself? Recharge and reconnect with your passion at the Rescue Me Retreat, a four-day, three-night getaway for animal caregivers, volunteers, and activists that focuses on managing compassion fatigue and burnout. During the retreat, you'll be surrounded by a small group of people that share your passion for helping animals. You'll be given a safe space to talk about some of the struggles that are inherent in animal welfare work, plus the opportunity to slow down, relax, and have fun. The Rescue Me Retreat will be held from June 29th through July 2nd on beautiful Lake Michigan and includes healthy meals, nature hikes, massage, group activities, and discussions, one-on-one -on -one sessions with compassion fatigue therapist Jennifer Blau, access to the beach and water activities, yoga, and more. Learn more at thecompassionfatiguepodcast.com slash rescue dash me dash retreat and get $100 off if you register before April 1st. You spend so much time taking care of others. You deserve this. <coughs> Have you spoken with your vet about the Feline Fix by Five Months campaign? Fix by Five is a program to raise awareness about the importance of getting kittens fixed before they are five months old in order to prevent unplanned litters. Fix by Five has now been endorsed by all the major national veterinary organizations. We urge you now to make sure that your vet has this information, and is able to share it with clients. To get the full story, check out Fix by Five Months' website. Google Fix by Five to get all the information. Again, Google Fix by Five for free vet info packets, media kits, articles, and more. Remember, Fix by Five saves lives. And then there are also the cat toys where, and I have to say I haven't tried this yet, but I am going to... I, it's my New Year's resolution or to do it in 2018 is uh, getting one of those toys where the cats bat them around and then treats fall out. Uh, do you have any specific thoughts or opinions on those? I do. Um, so food puzzles are wonderful. Every cat is different in how they like to play. And so I think having a variety of those are great. I also teach people how to very easily and affordably have their cats forage for food. You can use just plain sandwich bags, those brown sandwich bags that we used to bring to school that mm -hmm. kids don't do anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but you can teach a cat how to um, break open a sandwich bag and you can hide them around the house. Uh, you can feed them small kibbles of food or, or canned food on plates and different surfaces and in different rooms. I like to bring the outdoors in and cats outside forage for food. They actually love to dumpster dive. That's where they get the majority of their food. And so creating a, a dumpster diving cat in your home is a way to keep them active and engaged and mentally stimulated. Hmm. That's very, very interesting. Um, and I will 
try and do that. I have one cat who's a semi-feral cat who tends to spend most of her time on our first floor and she doesn't really venture up to the second or the third and she's quite overweight. And uh, so if I force her, try and force her to come upstairs, maybe I'll try something like that for her. Um, actually with her, what you can do is you can just throw a treat across the room. You mm-hmm. know, do not force her to come upstairs. Cats, you know, she's, she's chosen the downstairs and at least she has a choice in where she can be getting her to play with wand toys, even elevating food. If you have just a, a coffee table that you can put it on the act of just jumping up to get the food is beneficial in helping lose weight. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about plants for cats. Um, are you a fan of having like cat grass in the house and uh, or multiple different kinds of plants? Do you have any thoughts in that direction? I do. And I'm actually very passionate about grass for cats. <laughs> I have been for years. It is my pet peeve. I believe that all cats, I, I said all, but I don't mean all, cats do enjoy grass and many of them are really lacking that access to it. Uh, the first thing that a, an indoor cat the ones that, that are door dashers who want to get outside, the first thing they do is go out there and eat grass. Um, I do believe that it's an essential part of what they enjoy. I think that they naturally know that it, it helps their digestions in some way. It gives them folic acid and B vitamins. I'm a huge fan of grass. So uh, we should definitely make sure we, we provide our indoor kitties. I actually, when we were talking before the beginning of the show, I was talking about moving my snoring cat out of the way. Um, and Hooch, who's my snoring cat, he used to be an indoor-outdoor cat. And then when we moved up here to Vermont, he is now an indoor-only cat because we just felt it was just too risky to have him out and about in this area, wooded area with lots of predators and stuff. But upon occasion, he does break out of the house. And as you said, the first thing he does is he goes straight to the grass. I personally believe that some cats are dying for grass. They try to eat other plants that aren't good for them. They chew on other substances in the house. And it's a simple solution to grow grass for them. On Desi and Rue's website, I blog and um, I've got several blogs on grass, if your listeners would like to read about it, I strongly believe in growing it for them. For those who cannot grow it, you can buy grass. My preferred grass for cats is a blend. It's rye, wheat, oat, and barley. I think sometimes wheat grass is a little too harsh if that's all that they're eating. But offering greens to indoor cats is a necessity. And while we're on the topic of of eating, what are your thoughts with regards to foods for cats? Do you have any specific nutritional recommendations? So I'm kind of way out there on that. We could probably (laughs) do an entire different show on the subject. I believe in feeding every food from every company in every flavor possible. I don't believe in one diet for cats. I think that they all require different diets. I don't want to rely on any one company to have a complete diet for my kitties. And again, I believe in being the natural cat. I look at cats that are outdoors and, again, want to bring the outdoors in. And outdoor cats would catch mice, squirrels, bugs, snakes, they scavenger in dumpsters. They don't eat one diet. It's a good point. It's a very good point. And I I think variety is good. We sometimes think like, oh, well, my kitty only likes this specific, you know, brand and flavor of food. And maybe it's not good to feed the same thing every day. Well, they have texture and taste preferences that they develop very early in life. And the pet food companies know that. So whatever a kitten is fed is likely what they will attach to. I know when I was in vet school, I was taught to feed one diet and one diet only and not to change it. Or if you did, you did it slowly over time. And I, along with everybody else, we never asked why. And to this day, I don't know why. So I've rethought that. And for many years now, I 
have subscribed to feeding kittens, again, anything and everything and a variety along with some people food. Cat foods are developed specifically nutritionally to be complete. And so I believe in buying commercially bought diets or feeding complete raw diets. But I don't want to depend on any one company to be the sole source of my cat's diet. If you were sitting in the room with a group of cat rescuers, cat owners, pretty much anybody who has any interest to do with anything with cats, is there any sage advice that you'd want to share with them? Uh, Those people that are in the room are already cat lovers and probably already know a lot. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know that they're the ones that need the sage advice. However, I like to look at life through a cat's point of view, not my point of view. And I think that that helps me to understand them better, to communicate with them better, and to know what they need. That's that's really important. I know that we've been have it, had a very cold and harsh winter in many parts of the country, and I know a lot of feeders who take care of many feral cat colonies worry about those cats. And and it is, it's tough. It's tough being out there in the wintertime, but it's the home that these cats know. And you do have to try and look, look at it through the cat's eyes and, you know, say, you know, this is, this is what they know. And they have their spaces where they can try and stay warm and that they are survivors and and that's what they're meant to be. But it's very hard. Sometimes it's very, very, very hard to think about it from the cat's perspective rather than, you know, here's our own wanting to help, wanting to take care of and nurture. It's hard to step back and let the cat be cat. I, I agree. Um, I worry every night when I go to bed in my warm house about the animals that are outside. Um, I'd love to see a kinder world where we took care of animals. The community cats are definitely better off being neutered and spayed. I think that's one of the biggest things that we've done for them. It has eliminated the fighting, a lot of the diseases, and I think the community cats are, are better off today than they were 20, 30 years ago, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And with each decade, we'll do even more for them. And there probably will be fewer of them out there, too, as we get more aggressive with our spaying and neutering in all of our communities. I hope so. Although I do think that a lot of communities really benefit from them. And so mm-hmm. doing the having cats as rodent control and as mousers are wonderful. Yep. Uh, I have become somewhat of an expert on rat population control. Because in the communities where our cat populations have dwindled to very few or none cats, the the rats are taking over. And then we have to somehow, because we're known as the cat people, then they turn to us because of the rats. And um, so it's just an interesting dynamic of changing the balance in the community. Yes, I agree. So, Lynn, um, if people are interested in finding out more about the work that you're doing, how could they find you? I'd love for them to visit my website. It's desiru.com, D as in dog, E as in Edward, Z as in zebra, I, R as in Robert, O, dot com. I try to blog several times a month and uh, talk about some of the things that we've talked about today. So uh, I would appreciate if they go there and read my blogs. Sounds great. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Keep doing what they're doing for cats. They need us. That's great. Yes, yes. I mean, it's a, it's a long road. We're all working really hard, um, but I think we are definitely making a, an incredible difference in the lives of cats, and I really do hope that down the road we're going to have uh, all of our communities are going to be humane communities for our cats. I absolutely second that. Thank you for doing what you do. So, Lynn, thank you again for agreeing to be a guest on my show, and I hope we'll have you on in the future. I hope so, too. Thank you, Stacey. If you like the Community Cats podcast and would like to help promote Community Cats in your state, then we need you. We're looking for a couple of people from each state to be Community Cats ambassadors. What do you get by being an ambassador? 
You'll be mailed a promo kit of items to use to help promote the show at any event that you attend in your state. If you don't attend many events, hey, that's okay too. Do you have a network of people that love community cats? You can help with email and groups in your state to let them know about the CCP and offer them the benefit of community cat swag. The more we can spread the word about the show, the more we can do to help cats across the country. Please email Stacy, S T A C Y, at communitycatspodcast.com if you'd like to represent your state. Thank you. Ah!